This morning, if you would turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 12, we'll look at the next paragraph in uh, Mark's gospel, again, looking to the Lord for a blessing upon his word to give us uh, instruction and encouragement in how we might love the Lord and how we might love others. In this case, it also has to do with how we might love ourselves by founding our lives upon his word. Mark chapter 12, we're going to read verses 18 through verse 27. Would you please listen carefully to this? This is God's word. And some Sadducees who say that there is no resurrection came to him and began questioning him, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves behind a wife and leaves no child, his brother should take the wife and raise up offspring to his brother. There were seven brothers, and the first took a wife and died, leaving no offspring. And the second one took her and died, leaving behind no offspring, and the third likewise, and so all seven left no offspring. Last of all, the woman died also. In the resurrection, when they rise again, which one's wife will she be? For all seven had her as wife. And Jesus said to them, Is this not the reason you are mistaken? That you do not understand the scriptures or the power of God? For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. But regarding the fact that the dead rise again, have you not read in the book of Moses in the passage about the burning bush how God spoke to him saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are greatly mistaken. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning. Now, as you know, uh, we're looking at a series of attacks against the Lord Jesus Christ to try and discredit him because of what he did in the temple as well as, of course, what he, did, what he had done throughout his ministry. But Jesus had come into Jerusalem and Jesus had come into the temple, of course, offended by what he saw. He drove them out of the temple. He overturned the tables of the money changers and so forth. And then he was confronted with the leaders who were in charge of what was going on in the temple. They came to Jesus and asked him by what authority he did these things. And Jesus, of course, asked them a question and said, if you tell me whether or not John's baptism was from God or man, I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Of course, they realized they couldn't answer that question because either way it would go against them. And so they said, we won't or we can't tell you. And Jesus said, I won't tell you. Well, next, the Pharisees and the Herodians came in order to accuse him as well. Their question had to do, of course, with taxation. We saw that one last week, and again, the hypocrisy of the whole situation is the Pharisees hated the taxes, and the Herodians supported it, but if Jesus sided one way or the other, then one of the other parties could accuse him. So again, their question was hypocritical, but again, Jesus answered the question in a way that was absolutely truthful, revealing to us what God's will is regarding these things, but did it in a way that they could not trap him, they could not ensnare him. Well, now we see the Sadducees coming, attempting to do exactly the same thing. I think you know from what we've just read that the Sadducees were what we would call the theological liberals of that day. They denied not all that had to do with the supernatural, but certainly a great deal of it. They believed that God existed. They were, in a sense, the deists of their day. They believed that God created all things and he kind of wound everything up. But then he left and um, just left things to work themselves out as they, as they did. But they denied virtually everything else. They denied the resurrection. They denied life after death. They denied the existence of angels. They denied the existence of spirits. Basically, they believed in God, but that was about it. Now, they bring to Jesus a question about the resurrection of all things. Obviously, their question shows their hypocrisy because they were asking Jesus about something that they themselves did not believe. They thought perhaps if they came down to Jesus' uh, level, as it were, to his, um, his belief system and asked him this question, 
that they might be able to show the people that his teaching on the subject is absurd and that they would be able to discredit him and get the people to turn away from him, which is what they've been trying to do, and prove their own position at the same time. Now this morning what we're going to look at is their question to Jesus and his response to see how important it is that you and I believe what the Bible teaches, that we make sure that our belief system, our opinions of what we think is, is right and wrong and true and false and so forth is actually based upon the word of God and not just based upon what we might choose to believe. It has to be founded on the word if we are to be safe and not to be, as the Sadducees were, mistaken, greatly mistaken. Now, first of all, let's consider the Sadducees' question and Jesus' response. Notice that their attack comes from very much the same source as the devil's attack. When Jesus was fasting in the wilderness, it comes from the scriptures. One of the commands that the Lord had given to his people through Moses regarding the laws of inheritance. Now, as you probably know in those days, land inheritance was very important to the people of God. God had given uh, land to certain tribes, and he wanted that land to remain with those tribes, which is why the situation exists that the, that the Sadducees are actually asking about. A woman could not in those days marry a husband, have that husband die, inherit his land, and then go and marry somebody from another tribe and take that land with them. The land needed to stay with the tribe, which is the reason why if a man married a woman and died without child, without an heir, then the brother of that man was to take the woman as wife, and I'm, I'm assuming in this case, uh, if he was not already married, and he would marry then the woman and the first child that she bore to him would be named after the brother. In other words, <clears throat> the brother or that child would get the brother's inheritance that died. And in that way, the land would stay within that particular tribe. And so on the basis of that, the Sadducees give Jesus a hypothetical situation. Those are always fun to, to wrestle with, although in this case, uh, they're using it to try to ensnare Jesus. They say, Jesus, uh, there were seven brothers. The first took a wife. And... Um, married her and then died without child. The second one took her uh, according to the law of Moses as he should. Uh, he also died without a child and then the third one married her and so forth all the way down to the seventh and finally the woman herself died. And in the process there were no heirs. Now since all of them were legitimately married to this woman according to the commandment of God, according to the scriptures in the resurrection, which of these brothers will she be married to since all are going to rise and since all had her as wife? Now their question assumes two things. First of all, the resurrection, which of course they denied. Again, pointing out their hypocrisy. But secondly, that marriage continues after death into the eternal state, which they also denied. And the question also assumes that Jesus actually acknowledged that both of these things were true. Now, certainly he does acknowledge the resurrection because it is true, but he doesn't acknowledge continuing marriage. Well, Jesus answers the second assumption first with regard to marriage after death. He says, you are mistaken. When they rise from the dead, they are neither married nor are given in marriage, but are like the angels. And what this means is, of course, the angels do not marry and they do not procreate. There are no baby angels. When God made the angels, he made all that he was going to make at one time, which is why they're also all put on trial at one time uh, because they could all be, you know, they all existed at one time and they could all be put on trial as far as whether or not they were going to follow Satan in the rebellion or stay true to the Lord and we know that many of them did follow Satan, but many more of them held fast to the Son of God. And why man, because he does procreate, of course, had to be put on trial through one individual, and that is Adam rather than the whole human race at one time. Angels do not marry. Angels do not 
procreate. Now, Jesus here, of course, is teaching us first clearly that marriage is only for this life. Marriage is for companionship in this life because we need that kind of help. We need that kind of closeness because we're not going to be able to share that with other people. And because of procreation, because the Lord desired the earth be populated and even in its current state of population still desires for those who marry who are Christians to raise up children uh, in the ways of the Lord. That might continue to serve him and honor him. Now that is only for this life. That is not something that continues after this life. In the new heavens and the new earth, after the resurrection and after the final judgment, there isn't going to be need for this kind of relationship any longer because the conditions will be different. And the kind of fellowship that we're going to have, the kind that we're seeking actually to to have even a shadow of while we're here through these various devotionals is going to there be absolutely perfect. By the way, it's going to be perfect between now and the, and the uh, eternal state as well before the resurrection, after we die, our souls certainly go to be with the Lord in heaven. But now we're considering what happens after the resurrection because that's what Jesus is talking about. In the new heavens and the new earth, we will have perfect fellowship holy fellowship, that is to say, one that is absolutely, perfectly loving with all the saints and with all the angels. That sin that alienates us from one another today, certainly from the people in the world and sadly, even within the church, won't be in that world. So there won't be any need for a special relationship that we have in the case of marriage today, at least from that one aspect. Because there, perfect love is going to be given by everyone and received by everyone from every single member of that perfect world. And one thing as we think about that, that we have to look forward to is this as well, that all the problems, all the offenses, all the things that separate believers, even believers here, are, ever, are really going to be forever resolved in that world. They're no longer going to plague us. We're going to be able to see things as they are and receive one another with a perfect kind of love, something which sadly, although we would think if we do everything according to Scripture, that it's all going to work out to a perfect resolution in this world of, of imperfection, it doesn't work out that way because of our continuing sin. But in that world, sin will be gone and we'll be able to embrace one another again as uh, brethren in the Lord with a pure and whole heart. And that is going to be wonderful. So in the new heavens and the new earth, there will not be any need for marriage because of the perfect fellowship we're going to have with every single saint and angel, not the least of which, of course, our Lord Jesus Christ is going to be there as well. And that's certainly going to fill a tremendous void in our hearts. But in the new heavens and the new earth, there's also not going to be any need for procreation or the raising of children because by that time, every child that is ever to be born into the world has already been born. Every child has already been raised for better or worse. Every person has either received or denied the Lord. There will not be any new souls to be created that vast multitude which the Lord tells us he is intended to save will be saved and will be safe and there won't be any need for anything more. The work will be done, at least that work. So since that work is, is done, the only thing that will be left for us to do will be to worship and to serve the Lord. And we don't know exactly what that service may entail in its fullness, if whether we're going to be spending all the time worshiping before the throne or whether the Lord has other things for us to do. But we'll be doing that, and that will occupy all our time in a new world of perfect love. And so again, there will no longer be any need for marriage. Now, does that mean that we're no longer going to know our spouse or recognize the fact that we were married to them? Well, I think we're going to know them. I think undoubtedly we're going to know them. Certainly if they were a believer, we will know them as well as everybody else that we knew in this world. 
but we're not going to know them in, in a different sense than we are, of course, the people who are there, and we're not going to share a different relationship than the one that was there, and it's not going to make us sad because we don't have that relationship any longer because now we're going to be sharing a greater love with a vast multitude of people, much greater than the love that we shared with our spouse, and it will be pure and a holy love. And again, let's not forget that the church herself is a bride, and she's married now to her husband. I do believe there is a sense in which we're married to Christ now, but the wedding supper of the Lamb is yet something that we'll rejoice in in the future. And so we collectively as a bride will be married to the bridegroom, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think we're going to have a hard time taking our eyes off of him in order to look at anyone else because of his glory and because, again, of his love, not to mention the Father and the Spirit, who will also reveal themselves to us in a way that we will be able to see them. Job, in the book of Job, talks about the day of the resurrection when he will be raised from the dead and he will see God with his own eyes and not another's. In other words, his body would be raised and he would see the Lord. So our Lord deals, first of all, with the issue of marriage. No, there is no marriage after the resurrection. We are like the angels, neither marry nor are given in marriage for the reasons we've already seen. But next he deals with the second error, that having to do with the resurrection, which is a more, much more serious error on their part. He says, haven't you read in Moses at the account of the burning bush where God said to him, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He isn't the God of the dead, but of the living. Now, we often talk about, as we're studying the scriptures, the doctrine of what we call verbal plenary inspiration, the idea that, that when God breathes out the word of God, every single word is inspired. Every single word is God breathed. It's exactly the word he wants it to be. And that extends to all the words of scripture. We often prove that point from Paul's argument that he makes to the Galatians. Uh, when he says this, with re now he says, uh, now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say and to seeds, as referring to many, but rather to one and to your seed, that is Christ. Paul makes an argument uh, to the Galatians on the basis of the fact that a word is singular rather than plural showing us that you, you know, if you're going to draw that kind of an argument from Scripture, then every single word has to be precisely the word that God wants it to be in Scripture, showing that, again, inspiration extends to every word. But we see this demonstrated again because what does Jesus make his argument based upon in this particular passage? On the tense of the verb. He does not say, I was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. When God spoke to Moses, the patriarchs, even though they had died uh, centuries ago, were still alive. Now, in what sense were they still alive? Well, they were alive in that sense that the Sadducees actually denied. They were the spirits of righteous men made perfect in heaven. Life continued for them. Their souls were alive. Yes, there is life after death. And, of course, one day God is going to raise their bodies. So Jesus told them with regard to marriage after death, they were mistaken. But with regard to the resurrection, I think this is why he ends this statement as he does. They were greatly mistaken. Now, belief in marriage after death, as a matter of fact, I, <laughs> the college I went to, the head of the Bible department, believed that he would be married to his wife in, in heaven and that that would go on forever. I, I pointed out this verse to him, but he didn't want to believe it. Now, I think a Christian can believe that. They can be in error, of course. You know, that, that's wrong. It's not going to help them to believe that. But they can still be a Christian. They're mistaken. But with regard to the resurrection, now that is an error that is a much greater error. Failure to believe in the resurrection will actually means that a person really can't be saved. 
Now, I know that's kind of a harsh statement, so let's try to prove it. I think that's why Jesus said they were greatly mistaken. Why is it important to believe in life after death? Why does it matter? Well, it matters, first of all, because, as we saw two weeks ago when we were you know, celebrating Easter, Resurrection Sunday, which, of course, you know, as believers, we should celebrate every Lord's Day, we saw the importance of the resurrection because if there is no resurrection, then even Jesus has not been raised from the dead. And if Jesus has not been raised from the dead, neither will you be, Paul said to the Corinthians. And as a matter of fact, all the believers who have died have perished. And if we believed in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. If there is no resurrection, then not only will we uh, not, well, we won't be raised from the dead, but I think Paul goes as far as to say as we'll be condemned. Because remember, Christ's justification, the fact that his sacrifice was accepted by God was evidenced by the resurrection. If our sins were laid on Jesus and he died because of our sins, but his atonement did not take care of our sins, that would be the reason why he wouldn't rise from the dead. And if he didn't rise from the dead because his sacrifice did not take care of our sins, we're not going to rise from it either. And that means that he went to hell with those sins attached to him and that we will as well because our sins are not forgiven. The resurrection is important. But it's also important because of how it affects your life. If you don't believe in life after death, if you don't believe there's any existence at the end of the road, it's going to have a profound impact on how you actually live your life. The temptation will be there, of course, well, if you're a Christian even, you know, to not, not to take things very seriously, but if you're not a Christian, like these Sadducees, then it's just an excuse to live a libertarian life. Let's eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow we die, and after that, it all ends. Well, if that's what you believe, then you're not going to get ready for anything because there's nothing to get ready for. You're not going to trust in Jesus Christ because there's no reason to trust him. There's no danger at the end of the road. So you won't turn from your sins. You won't repent. You won't trust in Jesus Christ if you do not believe in the resurrection. That is a great mistake. But the point that Jesus is making here is life does not end there. It does continue after death. And there is also a judgment to face. Not right after death, but when the Lord comes again to raise all the dead. And if you believe that that's true, it is going to make a difference in the way you live. It's going to push you in one direction or another. It's either going to force you to the Savior or it's going to make you become bitter against him. But you're not going to be indifferent. Now, the Sadducees were mistaken. They were greatly mistaken. But why were they so wrong? How did they get so far off? Now, here's one of the things I think that we need to consider especially this evening when we consider the evidence for God, it's not that they didn't have enough evidence. They knew God existed. What was their problem? Well, Jesus tells us in verse 24 what their problem was. Is this not the reason you are mistaken? That you do not understand the scriptures or the power of God. It wasn't the fact that they didn't believe in God. Their problem was they didn't understand the scriptures. They didn't understand the power of God. Now, I don't think it's that they could not understand what God's word said. It was quite simple. The argument that Jesus made was you know, a very simple argument that was very profound, very straightforward, and it solved the case immediately. I don't think that it's not that they couldn't understand the scriptures, and it wasn't that they didn't understand how powerful God was. After all, they believed he created the universe. Their problem went deeper than that. They were willfully ignorant of the things that God said in his word because of the wickedness of their hearts. One thing that all these groups that come to Jesus have in common is the fact that they all, even though they believe they may love God, they all actually hate God, and they showed that they did by rejecting his son. They knew what the scripture said. They knew what God was capable of, but they chose not to believe it. Their problem was unbelief. Their problem was sin. They needed to repent of that unbelief, of refusing to believe what they knew scripture said, of refusing to submit 
to God's truth. And especially, they needed to repent of their rebellion against God, which was revealed by their not receiving their, his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, as their Lord and Savior. Now, this was their greatest mistake. And this is one that is, is one that you cannot recover from unless you repent of it. And how many people are there in the world that are in exactly that situation? And how many people in the church who are as well? You believe that God exists. You know what his word actually says. But you refuse to believe and to submit to it. Or that God is actually going to do what he said he's going to do. You need to repent and you need to believe as they needed to repent and believe because what the Bible says is true. There is life after death. There is a final judgment. There is heaven and hell. There is a resurrection and you need to be ready for it. You need to trust Jesus Christ and turn from your sins or you will be spending eternity in that place that you do not believe exists. That is hell. The only way to escape it is to trust in Jesus to save you from your sins and to turn from your sins and begin to follow him. Now we've seen two examples of errors that the Sadducees had. One that was a more minor error in which they were mistaken. That is marriage continues after the resurrection after into the new heavens and the new earth. But there was a greater error that was that of the resurrection. That was a very serious one that could condemn them. I think it follows from what we've seen that we certainly need to avoid every condemning error, but certainly we need to avoid any area that we possibly can where we're mistaken regarding what Scripture actually says or what God is able and willing to do. Because in both of those areas, any, any part you're in error is going to hurt you in some way. There's only one standard of truth that God has given to us, and that certainly is the Bible. Whatever doesn't agree with the Scripture is wrong, regardless of who may hold that belief. And error of any kind is going to, to take you down a path that is going to injure you in some way. So you need to be careful. Again, I've already pointed out some errors are worse than others. There are those that are foundational to the gospel by which we are saved. And if we are wrong on one of those, we can be wrong enough you know, to miss heaven. If we don't believe, for instance, that God is triune, we're believing in a false God. If we don't believe that Jesus is God and man, we're believing in a false Jesus. If we don't believe that we're saved by grace through faith alone and that we think somehow works is something that we have to do to save ourselves, we destroy the gospel. There are certain things that we have to believe. Certainly, today, one of the major things that the churches seem to miss is the fact that we not only have to trust Jesus, but we also have to turn from our sins and we have to follow him. That's where we get into this whole lordship, anti-lordship, and so forth. That, too, can be a condemning error if we believe that. Well, we believe that's true and we practice that. The Bible says if we don't pick up our crosses and follow Jesus, then we're not true believers. So we need to do that. So there are those kinds of errors, but there are other errors that won't necessarily destroy you. But we have to admit, and I think every church would admit this, every church would recognize that any place that we deviate from the scriptures is going to hurt us in some way. Again, if we walk according to a lie, that can't help us. It's only when we walk according to truth. Now, again, I, I believe every Bible-believing church certainly believes that. They would not argue with me on that point. We may disagree on, on what exactly the Bible says, but I think we would all agree that anywhere we deviate from Scripture is going to hurt us in some way. We do not want to misunderstand what the Bible says, and we certainly don't want also to misunderstand what God is capable of doing and what he has said he will do. We don't want to be wrong about the meaning of Scripture or the power of God. So we need to make sure that we read it and examine
examine it and, and also judge everything that we hear, every opinion, everything that we're taught by anyone in the church or outside the church, although I don't know I'd be listening to people outside the church, but take everything to Scripture and see if this is in fact what Scripture says. You know that when the Apostle Paul was preaching to the Bereans, that Luke commended the Bereans because they took what Paul said and they examined the scriptures every day to see whether or not what Paul was saying was actually true. That's what we need to be doing. By the way, that's one also great advantage of being involved in the Reading the Bible Together program is that it gets you into the Word of God so that you can read it more, you can interact with one another on it more, and you can come to a better understanding of what it says so that you will be able to do, well, not only to know what it says, but knowing what it says, you'll be encouraged to do it with others as you read it together. So make sure that you understand the scriptures. Make sure you take all the ideas that you have. Make sure they're grounded in scripture. If you're reading through the Bible and you come across a passage that challenges something that you believe, then you need to come to grips with that. You need to examine that. You need to come to the truth. If you hear somebody teaching something, bring it to the scriptures. Is this what the scripture actually says? If it is, embrace it. If it isn't, reject it. We have to do that with every single thing that we believe to be God's truth. And make sure at the same time that you're not doubting also God with regard to his power to do all that he had promised to do. I think Jesus was implying that the, the Sadducees did not believe that God had the power to raise the dead. Isn't, isn't this the reason you're mistaken? Because you don't understand the scriptures or the power of God? You don't think he can do it. Let's not be mistaken on either account because if we understand what the Bible says and we begin to move to do what it says, but we don't believe that God has the power to do what he said he would do to help us, it's going to cripple us as far as doing what we know we need to do from scripture. You already heard a testimony this morning from the Miles as far as if we go onto the field, what's going to happen to our child? But they believed that God was going to heal their child. God had revealed that to them, and he, God actually did that and, and probably did that to encourage them that he was going to be with them on the field and was going to do the things that he had promised he was going to do, and they didn't have to worry about it. They didn't have to fear. We must not be mistaken about either what God says in his word or that he has the ability to carry through what he says he's going to do. Now, this is interesting uh, as, we, as we look at uh, the Lord's putting different things together uh, for us as we, as we sort of walk through this pilgrimage and we worship from week to week. And as we're starting a new series in the evening without even considering in the morning what it is we'd be looking at, the Lord seems to have joined these two things together and one just flows out of the other. We've just seen how important it is that we ground our belief in the Word of God. What we're going to start looking at this evening is a series that is both apologetic and polemic. Apologetics has to do with defending the Christian faith to unbelievers, showing them why we believe what we believe through an argument that they can see. Well, we're going to start doing that in the evenings. We're also going to start looking at why it is we believe the things that we believe as, as a church, as over against other churches, and even other churches that believe perhaps themselves to be churches that aren't churches. Why do we believe in the Trinity? Why do we believe that Jesus is God and man? Why do we believe that we're saved by grace through faith? Those are the, you know, the, the foundational ones, and we want to make sure that we're grounded in that. But we're also going to look at why we believe things differently than other churches um, with regard to those areas we can disagree on and still be Christians, but recognizing that if we still believe something that isn't true, it's still going to hurt us. So we want to make sure that as best as possible we understand the Word of God and that we you know, are not only understanding and believing it, but actually practicing it so that we don't fall into that pitfall. There are, again, errors that can destroy us, and there are errors that can only harm us. We're going to be looking at both kinds of errors. This evening, we're going to begin, again, by looking at why we believe that God exists. That's actually quite easy to demonstrate, but we're going to look at one of the many different arguments uh, 
with regard to that to strengthen our faith, but also to give us the ammunition we need to be able to help others see the same thing. Actually, we're going to find out this evening. Everybody already sees it. Everybody already knows it. So these arguments are going to be more along the lines of trying to tear down the walls they've built up to try to hide themselves from it so that they come face to face. Now again, why are we going to do this? Because we don't want to be mistaken. We don't want to be greatly mistaken. We don't want to find out on the day of judgment we believe things that ultimately will destroy us. We want to make sure that we believe the truth and we're living the truth because that's the only safe way to go. There is a day of judgment coming and we need to make sure that we are ready for it. So I say that as a word of encouragement to all of us to come back this evening and be a part of this study so that we can ground ourselves or, or further ground ourselves in the truth of God. We don't want to be mistaken. Well, may the Lord help us uh, to do that. And uh, may he also especially impress upon us this morning the importance of believing his truth, understanding it, believing it, and living according to it. Let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to apply his word to us.